Welcome everyone to Crash Course Apologetics, where I summarize the work of Christian scholars in animated videos and interviews. Today we're going to be commenting on a video produced by the channel Crash Course. That video is called Aquinas and the Cosmological Arguments. The link is in the description below. I encourage you to watch it first and then listen to this video so that you'll get the most out of it. I'm joined by Dr. Josh Rasmussen. Let me go ahead and bring him in to the chat. Hey there, Dr. Rasmussen. Um, will Hi. you just briefly give us a little bit of info about your background in philosophy and uh, feel free to mention any work you've done on the topic of cosmological arguments? Yeah, sure. So I got my PhD in philosophy from the University of Notre Dame. I studied under Alvin Plantinga, some people may know the name, and Peter Vanewagen. And my work in the field has focused on the foundations of existence, and so I've published quite a bit actually on the topic of cosmological arguments. I have several books. Uh, one of them is a co-author with Alexander Proust called Necessary Existence, and there we lay out uh, many different arguments of a cosmological sort, and I also have several peer-reviewed articles on this subject. Great. All right, well, uh, for those watching, we are going to play uh, a few clips from the original video. Um, these will be relatively short. Um, and then Dr. Rasmussen is just going to give his uh, thoughts on what was said. So let's go ahead and play the first clip. Italian theologian and philosopher Thomas Aquinas encountered Anselm's argument. But, like many others, he just didn't buy it. Aquinas did believe in God. It was just that, as a philosopher, he felt that it was important to have evidence for your beliefs. He knew that if he was going to dismiss Anselm's argument, he'd need to come up with something better. Okay, so first I wanted to just give a little preliminary about my purpose. So my whole goal here is to provide a philosopher's perspective in the mode of constructive criticism or constructive assessment so that this can really be of value to your audience. That's my goal. I don't want to destroy something, but I really want to draw out gold. That's a way, I think, of getting to more truth. So that's what I'm going to do as we look at these different pieces of the video. So this first part of the video is pointing to the value of evidence and how philosophers think about evidence. And so I paused the video at this point because I was thinking that this actually highlights a central, central point for many truth seekers. How do you get to truth? Well, you get to truth through evidence, but what is evidence? And in the popular sphere, what I've noticed is that evidence-based beliefs, that's kind of a flag for I'm being intellectually responsible if I can give evidence for my beliefs, all right? Philosophers, we have different theories of evidence. And I think for your audience, it would be helpful just to categorize two broad ideas of evidence, one being uh, a narrow view of evidence where we're limiting our evidence to what you can detect through the five senses versus a kind of broader view of evidence that's going to include any kind of rational reasons, including reasons at the foundation of logic, as well as reasons at the foundation of understanding science and the scientific method itself. So if you think of evidence in this wide way that includes any kind of rational reasons, then it's going to include the kinds of reasons that philosophers will give even when they're talking about Anselm's ontological argument. Because in that clip, he was contrasting Anselm's argument with this cosmological argument that we're going to be discussing. And he was suggesting that Aquinas really wants evidence. He he cares about evidence, and that's why he's going to dismiss Anselm's argument. Mm. Well, he's not going to dismiss Anselm's argument on the basis of evidence in this broad conception, because the broad conception will include the kind of logical reasoning that is justificatory, can be a basis for belief and even knowledge, but isn't just based on the five empirical senses. Mm. So I think it's helpful to kind of make this distinction because when you're thinking about these different arguments, in order to evaluate them, you want to evaluate them with the tools of reasoning and evidence. If you have an overly limited view or concept of evidence, then you might limit yourself from considering all the kinds of justifications that can play a role in thinking about arguments of this sort and other sorts. Very good. All right. 
Um, well, let's go ahead and play this next clip. His cosmological arguments is known as the argument from motion. In it, Aquinas observed that we currently live in a world in which things are moving, and he also observed that movement is caused by movers, things that cause motion. Aquinas was convinced that everything that's moving must have been set into motion by something else that was moving. By this logic, something must have started the motion in the first place. Otherwise, you'd be stuck in a philosophical quandary known as an infinite regress. You get an infinite regress when, in a chain of reasoning, the evidence for each point along the chain relies on the existence of something that came before it, which in turn relies on something even further back and so on with no starting point. Basically, Aquinas thought the very idea of infinite regress was absurd, logically impossible. Okay, what are your thoughts there? So a central part of this video focuses on infinite regresses as playing a role in Aquinas' cosmological arguments. And in this clip, I noticed sort of two things I want to discuss. One is the definition of infinite regress and then also on the different types of regresses. So I wanna just comment on his definition of an infinite regress. So notice that his definition is in terms of a chain of reasoning. Reasoning is an epistemic notion. It's a notion of something that can justify a belief, like a reason. And so we might call this an epistemic regress. Now, the first thing I wanna point out is that this is not a standard definition in the context of cosmological arguments. So cosmological arguments, they're not thinking about epistemic regresses, regresses of reasons, but rather you might call it a metaphysical regress or an ontological regress of causes and effects in the world. So when Aquinas, for example, talks about a chain of events, like the event of the wind blowing a leaf to turn over, that event of the wind blowing the leaf over is not a reasoning event. It's a kind of causal series. So that's the first point that I think can be helpful to clarify. It's not that there aren't epistemic regresses, but one of the tools for making progress in philosophy is just to make some distinctions. And so this distinction can help us to understand the cosmological argument in some more depth. And then the next distinction I wanna make is between different types of metaphysical or ontological regresses. So it turns out that Thomas Aquinas actually does allow for an infinite regress. He doesn't have arguments that will rule out the possibility of an infinite regress, despite the, the impression you might get from watching the video. Um, but I think what's right about the video is that there's a certain type of regress that he's going to argue against. So Aquinas distinguishes between two types of causal series. There's the per accidents and the per se series, or sometimes called accidentally ordered versus essentially ordered, or to be more picturesque about it, it's the difference between a uh, horizontal series back in time versus a vertical series yeah. at the present moment. And this is a classic distinction. And in these arguments, the scholars that I've read say that Aquinas is interested in the essentially ordered regress, and he's trying to argue that that can't be infinite. So the next clip is about a reason that he says that Aquinas has for, for ruling out the infinite regress. Okay. And this is important also for drawing out the relevance of that distinction. So if you want to play that clip. Yep, I'll play it now. The idea of infinite regress was absurd, logically impossible, because it implied that any given series of events began with nothing, or more accurately, never really began. Instead, it could have been going on forever. In the case of physical motion, Aquinas wanted to trace the cause of the movement he saw in the world all the way back to its beginning. And he figured there must have been a beginning. Otherwise, for him, it would be like watching these blocks fall and being told that nothing ever pushed over the first block. Instead, they had always been falling down forever, backward into eternity. There must have been a time when nothing was in motion, Aquinas thought, and there also must have been a static being that started the motion. And that being, according to Aquinas, is God, the unmoved mover. All right, so what's going on here in this clip? So I see there's two issues here. So first is about time. Did time begin, according to Aquinas? And then the second issue is, what is this argument against the infinite regress? So very quickly, just on time, I just want to really emphasize that he left it open whether time has an ultimate beginning, at least for the sake of argument. So I wanted to really look this up and cite an authority on this. Aquinas scholar John Whipple writes in his article, Did Thomas Aquinas defend the possibility of an eternally created world? He says that 
In Thomas's eyes, one cannot demonstrate either the eternity or the non-eternity of the world. So it's not part of his argument here to demonstrate that the world had a beginning. Mm. In fact, he's very explicit that he's trying to make an argument that doesn't depend on the beginning of the world. That's one of the advantages you might think of this argument. And again, because it's focused on only that vertical regress, not that horizontal regress back in time. Across time, yeah. Yes. And then the second thing that I wanted to note here was about his argument against the regress. So his argument against an infinitely essentially ordered regress, that is that vertical re- regress, is going to be a different kind of argument. It's an argument for the beginning of the universe. And it would be something like, without an ultimate cause, you wouldn't have any effects. And sort of to illustrate, this is kind of how I think about it. Like, imagine that I walk outside and I see a turtle just hanging in the air. And I'm wondering, that's odd. How is that turtle just there hanging in the air? And I look up and I see, oh, it's actually hanging on another turtle. So that explains why that first turtle is hanging in the air because it's hanging on another turtle. But of course, I'm wondering, how did that other turtle get up there? And I, and I see, oh, it's hanging on another turtle. And you see where this is going. Each turtle is hanging on another turtle up and up and up all the way to infinity. Mm-hmm. Now, you might think that in this case, you haven't really explained how there could be that first turtle that, that i'm seeing in the air suspended it's in just the pushing air. yeah yeah it's just sort of pushing it's pushing the explanation back in order to really understand how that turtle is in the air you need to understand how those turtles are in the air and to do that you need something that is acting as a kind of ultimate cause now this is sort of one idea i mean again there are debates about how to flesh out this argument um, and my goal isn't even to defend the argument here but just to clarify that his argument against the infinite regress is not an argument for a beginning in time. Again, because he allows for there being no beginning in time. And that's the important point. That That's kind of the big point here is I really want your viewers to see what his argument is and to distinguish it from a kind of caricature that isn't actually his argument. Right. That's my main goal. Here. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's really helpful. Okay. And I want to add, if I may, just one more point here because this is relevant to cosmological arguments more generally. My favorite cosmological arguments don't depend on any argument for a finite chain, either a horizontal chain or a vertical chain. So my favorite arguments just allow that there's an infinite horizontal chain, there's an infinite vertical chain, maybe there's infinitely many dimensions of series, and they're all infinite, and that's fine. And then then I can still build an argument for explaining the whole in terms of some sort of fundamental first cause that explains how there can be anything rather than just nothing. And that's a different kind of argument, but I want to bring that in here just so that your viewers understand that cosmological arguments in general aren't essentially tied to this particular path that has to rule out an infinite regress. One of the reasons it's so important to represent a person's argument accurately is so that when you come to the place of critically analyzing the argument and coming up with objections, you're not going to waste your time coming up with objections that don't really target the argument itself and so in this next clip you'll see that he's going to offer an objection to aquinas's argument based on this infinite regress premise if you want to play that yeah the first is simply that aquinas was wrong in his insistence that there can't be an infinite regress of anything aquinas takes it as a given that there had to be a starting point for everything whether it's the movement of objects or causes and effects or contingent beings being created but it's unclear that this is true or why it has to be true if infinite regress can be possible then aquinas's first two arguments fall apart yeah so here what hank green is pointing out is that if if an infinite regress can be possible then Aquinas' first two arguments fall apart. And what we've seen here is that Aquinas actually will allow for the possibility of an infinite regress, but just that there's a certain type of regress, such that if that type is possible, then that is going to undermine those arguments. And so the lesson here is just that if we really want to learn from an argument, I think we got to put it in its best light so that we can not waste time dealing with objections that don't squarely hit the argument. And the other thing that I want to just mention here is that Aquinas' arguments in his five ways are opening summaries. So the scholars who talk about Aquinas' arguments, they'll point out that he gives these kind of summary arguments, but then he develops those arguments in more detail. And that's relevant to some of the analysis we'll get to later in, in this review. 
All right, so now we're going to look at a, a few more clips here that fit under what you're calling uh, the social proof. This video talks a lot about um, how other people don't think this is a good argument. Mm. And so this is sort of a lack, there's a lack of social proof. And I think that's sort of an interesting thing. So if you want to play the clip on that, I wanted to put his claim to the test. And so I'll tell you about that. And by and large, philosophers, theists and atheists alike, have been relatively unimpressed by these four. So I thought it was sort of striking that he's saying that atheists and theists alike have been relatively unimpressed by the argument. And I thought, well, is that actually true? And like, you know, how does he know that, right? So I'm connected to philosophers and there's a particular group called the Analytic Collective and it collects philosophers um, who are theist friendly. So I wanted to look at you know, are theists relatively unimpressed? Now, I should just say this group doesn't have only theists, um, but they're generally theist friendly. And uh, it also includes philosophers who have published on the cosmological argument, including on Aquinas' argument. Um, now, not everybody in this group is a professional philosopher, but it's generally for philosophers. And let me just add here that I myself am neutral on the question about whether his argument is impressive or not. Mm -hmm. I think it depends on how you cash it out. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at just those initial summaries, well, I'm gonna wanna see a little more detail and there are different ways of cashing it out and some ways are maybe more impressive than others. But let me just say, I was actually kind of surprised. So I surveyed the group, I asked them, I said, are you relatively unimpressed by Aquinas' third way argument? So instead of focusing on all the arguments, let's just pick one. And I um, also gave them a link to the video and I gave them the following choices. No, I think his third way has merit. Yes, I am relatively unimpressed and I'm not really unimpressed or impressed. I was intrigued by the response. I was actually kind of surprised how many thought that his third way uh, has, has merit and just said no. Um, so 24 out of the 36, so two thirds, thought that it had merit um, and then among those who didn't say directly no, it was split between those who say, I'm not really unimpressed or impressed versus those who say yes. So what that means is that only 14% were relatively unimpressed. And in that 14% group, somebody in that group added that he is impressed by other cosmological arguments. Mm -hmm. And so this goes back to, you know, can you develop this argument in more detail? And Aquinas himself develops the argument, so there's questions of interpretation. And so what I really want to just say here is that I'm not suggesting that you should be impressed or that you shouldn't be impressed. Um, I'm interested in the claim that philosophers, atheists and theists alike, have been relatively unimpressed. I mean, that's, that's a claim given with a certain kind of authority by someone who's not a philosopher, who doesn't work in the field. And I wanted just to see, is that claim true? Because I think a lot of times you, you watch these videos and because they're in the form of a video, they carry a kind of authority. And one of the things I think is so important is to really see these videos as servants of your mind rather than as authorities over your mind. Even experts, see the experts, myself, for example, who works in this field as just a servant. Don't believe me just because I'm telling you things. Like my whole goal is that you would be inspired, you'd become curious, you would test the claims and really think for yourself. And so that's what I wanted to do here. And I just thought it was kind of interesting how confident he was in just making this statement. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, well, is that true? So it doesn't seem to be supported by the data of this survey. Of course, it's a, kind of a small sample size. Um, but it is, again, philosophers working in the field. And many of them are quite impressed by the argument. Yeah, that's really interesting. So, yeah. So my final thought on this is just that social proof really matters because it's relevant to your curiosity. If all the experts think that the argument has no merit, you know, if, if you're watching a video about a certain argument and somebody says, the experts who really study this, they think it's just junk. You're not going to be very curious to investigate the argument and see if you can mine gold out of it because everybody who thinks about it just thinks it's a bad argument. And so that's why I think this really matters. It, it's relevant to know that the experts are debating this and they're thinking about it. And it's, it's, there's recent developments of the argument. And so it's really valuable to think about. And the more you think about these things, I think the more gold you can get out of the argument. Great. All right. Well, 
we're going to move on then to this next section. So you call this the identity stage. I'm going to play this clip and get your thoughts. Basically, this objection says that Aquinas' God is so far removed from the God that theists actually believe in that it doesn't help anything. But maybe you're happy just believing someone's out there. That's fine. But then how about multiple someones? Because guess what? Aquinas' arguments don't rule out polytheism. There's nothing in any of his arguments to prove that God isn't actually like a committee. Aquinas' cosmological arguments also don't prove the existence of a sentient god. So it might be an old guy with a beard, it might be six old guys with beards, but it also might be an egg or a turtle or just a big block of stone. So I really love this part of the video because it's highlighting the value of identifying what kind of a thing could exist uncaused. I mean, could there be a big stone or a turtle that's sort of the ultimate cause of reality? Could that be the first uncaused cause? Now, philosophers who work on the cosmological argument, what we'll do is we'll divide the argument into two stages. So there's this identity stage, which is devoted to identifying the nature of the first cause. And then there's this other stage, what's sometimes called stage one, which is devoted to seeing if we can argue for the existence of a first or ultimate cause. I think it's very helpful to make this distinction between the two stages because then once we're done with the first stage, we can then look at arguments that focus specifically on the identity stage. And Aquinas does this. You know, th this doesn't show up in the summary versions of his five ways, but it shows up throughout the book. In fact, I found my, my book here and I was like thumbing through this because I remembered when I read this, that he goes through all these different attributes like simplicity, um, perfection, the goodness, the limitlessness of the cause. And he makes these arguments that this first original cause would be limitless, would be perfect. And I myself have contributed arguments on this stage where I would make the argument that if this original cause were limited or in some way less than supreme, then it stands in need of a further cause or further explanation in the way that a turtle or a rock would. Mm. And if I could just tell a little story to illustrate this a little more, because I think this is an important stage of the argument that can really, I think, click for people. Yeah. So the story is, imagine you go into your garage and you discover that there's a blue bird in your garage. And you're like, how did that blue bird get there? Okay. And you look around, you don't see how it could have gotten there. And then you discover there's a little hole in the corner of the garage and you peek out that hole and you see a bird's nest. Now you form a hypothesis. The bird came into the garage from out there and maybe that's its nest, all right? You have an available explanation of the bird, but there's a different explanation. I mean, you've never seen that blue bird before. <laughs> so how do you know that it came from out there in that hole? Maybe, here's another idea. Maybe it just appeared in your garage uncaused from nothing. How do you rule that out, right? And my thought is that you rule that out by seeing that that bird is relevantly like the kinds of things we know to not just come from nothing, all right? So if somebody comes along and they say, well, here's a different explanation. Maybe that bird necessarily comes into being uncaused. And the necessity of its coming into being uncaused right there explains its existence. So you don't need to appeal to it coming from the outside. I don't think that's the best explanation. Again, because we have an available explanation that would explain this bird in the way that we would normally explain birds. Mm. Now, let's say a week later you come in and instead of seeing a blue bird, you see a red bird. Same thing because the difference in color between blue and red doesn't seem to be relevant to this ability to exist uncaused. And so then when you think about it, well, what would be relevant to the ability of a thing to be uncaused? Change in shape, change in size. If it was made of cheese, if it was made of ghosts, like it was made of something immaterial, could it be uncaused? It doesn't seem like those changes are relevant. And so one of the arguments that philosophers have made, and I've contributed to this argument, is, is to say that the kind of thing that would be relevantly different from the things that have external causes or explanations would be a supreme thing, a thing that is uh, completely perfect in its nature and it can't be improved upon. It's maximally great, as we might say. And uh, if that's right, if that's true, then we would have a reason to think that the first cause is God. But this is a separate argument, right? And Aquinas develops other arguments like this. That's why there is this identity stage. So I really think it's helpful for your viewers to realize that there are these other arguments that fill out the argument. And whether they succeed or not, that's open to investigation. Rather than cut them off before they're investigated, 
it's good to know that they're there so that we can be curious to investigate them. Very good. All right, well then, we're going to go to this last section. This is titled, The Most Devastating Objection, you call it. But perhaps the most significant charge made against Aquinas' arguments is that they're self-defeating. That is, they actually prove themselves wrong. For example, if Aquinas is right that everything must have been put into motion by something else, and everything must have a cause other than itself, then it seems that God should be subject to those same stipulations. And if God is somehow exempt from those rules, then why couldn't other things be exempt from them too? If they can exist without God being responsible for them, then we don't need God to establish things in the first place. I think the most devastating objection is really the most valuable objection because it points again to this value of identifying some relevant difference between the uncaused first cause and the things like birds and rocks and turtles that have outside causes that have external causes that that allow them to exist right and i think that kind of the worry behind the objection is that if you think of god as just like one more arbitrary entity like some big ghost or some mm-hmm. sky daddy or something like this, then I think it's really correct to wonder, well, what caused that? How is that relevantly different from turtles and rocks? Mm-hmm. In fact, it's probably like worse because not only is it kind of arbitrary in a way that still calls for an explanation, but it's so different from the ordinary things that it feels sort of like you're positing some spooky category beyond anything that we have any experience with. And that you might think is also a cost. Mm-hmm. And so I think actually... Rather than see this as a a problem for the cosmological argument, I would just turn it around and say it's an invitation to identify what would be the kind of thing that would be able to be uncaused. What would be a relevant difference? And again, I just I want to highlight this sort of in conclusion here, because I think this can really open up insight for you guys as you just think about this for yourself. Just ponder this for yourself, like think about rocks and then turtles and then think about changing their shape in your mind, changing their size changing their constitution. You know, would these kinds of changes account for their ability to be uncaused? You might think, like in the bird example, that if somehow there's a kind of necessity of the bird to be uncaused, then that would somehow explain its existence or something like this. But that, I think, just kind of pushes the question back. Like, what kind of a cause could be necessary, right? Like, Not a bird. I mean, it doesn't seem like a bird could just exist eternally and necessarily. Birds could be destroyed. They could fall apart. And so when I think about this, this it's just my perspective. It just seems to me that the kind of thing that would be able to be uncaused would have to be relevantly different from birds and rocks and chairs and, and turtles. And that kind of thing, I think, would be a supreme thing. I think if it were a supreme thing, that would be a relevant difference. But rather than sort of emphasize my perspective, I would really rather just sort of encourage your listeners to really just kind of ponder this and just think about that, like what would make the most sense? And I think that's kind of an important point that I want to close on is the value of these sort of philosophy videos inspiring curiosity. Because curiosity is going to make you more powerful to get more insight rather than some authority or expert sort of asserting or making a claim about whether an argument succeeds or fails or whether, you know, making this sort of authoritative claims, because I think sometimes that kind of blocks that curiosity. And that's what I really want to do is sort of invite people to look at this argument, look at related arguments, investigate them in ways that really make sense to that. So does that make sense? Yeah, that's really good. All right. Well, uh, we will wrap up the video there. Thank you for watching. And if you can't wait to hear more, then you're in luck because this is a playlist of videos that you're watching. So next up will be Dr. Poston, who is a professor of philosophy at the University of Alabama. He'll be talking about intelligent design. So stick around for that. And if you enjoy the content of this video, I would encourage you to check out my other videos as well. And if you enjoy the content of the channel, then consider subscribing. See you soon. Thanks.